Holy Ghost. Our gospel lesson today centered on the first of Jesus' miracles at the wedding of Cana perhaps begs more questions than it provides immediate answers. Why did Jesus choose this as the first of his miracles? Why did Mary, his mother, come to him when the the wine ran dry? Did she know that he had miraculous powers? What are we to make of the response that he gave her? And then, after answering her like that, why did he go ahead and perform a miracle anyway? Why six water pots? And was there any significance to the detail of them being made of stone? The passage upon first read seems more vexing than revealing. And while we lack the time today to appropriately answer all of these questions, we can dig into some of the rich symbolism and context that this moment in redemptive history holds for each believer. When we stop and think about that history, it truly is fitting that this was the event at which Jesus performed his first miracle and begins his ministerial journey. The Bible starts with the wedding of Adam and Eve. God speaks to Israel through the prophets as though she were his wayward bride. And Revelation ends with the church, depicted as the beautiful, holy bride of Christ. Indeed, all of Scripture is bound together by a few of God's central themes, and this one is about marriage. But why was this wedding so special? In keeping with many church fathers and scholars, I would suggest to you that it holds special significance Because while it was the last step in the wedding custom of the Jews that Jesus was attending, it was actually the first step in Jesus' mission to be bound to the bride he came down to redeem. The custom at that time called for two parts to a Jewish marriage. The first was known as the Kedushin. The second was the Chuppah. The Kedushin was the betrothal. It was a pledge of the parties to one another documented in a covenantal contract which stated that the parties were essentially dedicated to one another in the bond of marriage. They were actually treated as married. This betrothal lasted uh, typically about a year, during which time the groom would go and prepare a place for them to live out their days together as man and wife. We would liken this part of the custom to our modern day engagement period. The Caducian was also a celebratory event during which the bride was presented with a symbolic cup of wine to drink as her acceptance of this covenant. The chuppah was the event that Jesus was attending in Canaan. It was where the happy couple was brought together to finalize the marriage or seal the deal. And it typically involved days of festivities and family and friends. It is during this event that the man comes out of his bridegroom chamber to meet his bride and finally take her unto himself. And it is at this event that he makes good on the contract he provided at the Caducian or engagement all sealed with, yet again, a cup of wine shared between the two. It was undoubtedly a joyous occasion for all. And as we can infer from the text, the wine was flowing rather well, to the point that they ran out. And thus enters Mary, the mother of Jesus, who many scholars presume was helping in the orchestration of this celebration, and likely a close friend, or more likely, a relative of one of the persons being married. It would have been socially awkward for them to run out of wine, a bit of a crisis. So she turns to her son and notifies him of the predicament. Now we don't know from scripture if Mary had an idea that he could or would perform a miracle. His response, mine hour is not yet come, would seem to indicate that she knew more than the average person. 
that she knew something would become of him, just as the angel of the Lord had foretold. But we cannot be certain of the details with which she was or was not familiar with. What I think we can safely assume is that Mary knew Jesus had entered into the next phase of his mission. Having just been baptized by John, spending 40 days in the wilderness, declared to be the Lamb of God, and now calling disciples to himself just prior to this event. Perhaps she thought to herself, now is a good time for you to kick off the real reason you're here. Or perhaps she was just turning to him as the man of the house for help. And as we know, despite his very curious response, Jesus helped. Or, and of course, he knew he was going to before she even asked him to. He had the servants fill the stone water pots used for purification with water, and he turned it to wine. And not just any wine, but the best wine. And so those closest to Jesus and the servants standing by got the first glimpse of the power of his divinity. But I would suggest they also got a glimpse of something else that probably did not make sense until much later. That Jesus' response, mine hour is not yet come, was not about whether to manifest his glory via the miraculous, but rather was a reference regarding his own contract, his own kedushin with his bride-to-be. It was only the beginning of his ministry and his mission, and there was much work to be done before taking on the kedushin. So what does Jesus do? He gives us a glimpse of what was to come. He takes pots of water used for an old covenant ritual of purification, and then, perhaps in the spirit of Moses in the wilderness, brings forth something new from stone. Not water, but wine. Wine that would come to signify the removal of the old covenant in Moses and his new and everlasting covenant with us. Those in attendance got a foreshadowing taste of what was to come. The offering of his own blood as the wine of his marriage contract with his people, the Holy Church. So if that wasn't his hour, then when was it? If we skip forward toward the end of Jesus' ministry, we find him in the upper room celebrating the Passover with the disciples. And pay attention now. After offering to them a cup of wine, what does he say to them? John chapters 13 and 14 record this. Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. St. Matthew offers us this other detail in chapter 26 of his gospel. As Jesus offers the cup to his disciples, he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This was Jesus' hour. As the new and perfect Adam the groomsman offered to his bride the cup of the caduceus and vowed to go and prepare a place where he and his bride would live together forever and then sealed that covenant with his own blood shed on the cross. The miracle at the wedding in Cana points to the profound, absolutely profound work of Christ as our Redeemer our groomsman and the mediator of our new relationship with him as his bride. And he gave us 
this blessed sacrament as both a means of grace and for a constant reminder of who we are to him and his pledge of love to us. Unless we fall prey to the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, we would do well to carry this event at Cana and its full meaning in our hearts. For St. Paul said to the Corinthian church, For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thought will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So let us hold fast to what this means for us as his bride. And let us gather now together around this sacrament of Holy Communion based on the event through which our Lord was glorified and by which he sealed his betrothal to us. Let us come with faith and with joyful reassurance that he will come to us again, uniting us with him in his Father's kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.